Welcome to lunchtime on day eight. Um, if you've joined our sessions this morning, welcome back if this is your first one of the day. Happy St. Paddy's Day. Um, I am married to Justin Murphy, who reliably tells me that Murphy's are Irish. So uh, we're having lamb and Guinness for dinner, which is something to look forward to. Although um, I'm not sure if it necessarily fits into our next speaker's uh, idea of a healthy meal, but uh, hopefully you can let me off on this occasion, Susan. And for people that remember Susan from last year, if you were at Vid19, Susan is a health expert who loves helping women who are stretched, stressed and struggling. Often they are in demanding careers that may or may not have, and may or may not have family to also juggle. She knows what happens when women don't prioritize their well-being. She did it and has seen hundreds of clients do the same thing. Susan's priority is empowering and educating women so they can avoid the inevitable burnout that comes from pushing too hard and losing sight of what's really important them. She's a qualified naturopath with a background in psychology and health sociology. She spent almost 15 years of, in clinical experience in nutrition and integrative functional medicine and has a reputation for employing deep care, empathy and authenticity. And uh, Susan, I know we've spoken a lot of over the last few years and I know that uh, this is the one part of my life that I have to very consciously and very consistently try and work out and I never quite get it right um, and part of it is is that I think I need to prioritize everyone else so when you said that it's not selfish I was like yes come and talk about that <laughs> <laughs> yes and I want everyone women and men included feeling that they can prioritize their well-being uh, thank you for having me um, again at the VID conference. It was really fun last year in very di different circumstances, but it's really nice to be here this year again. And I am going to be talking about well-being. I'm going to be talking about this concept of radical self-care and how it is imperative. And we're going to explore what radical self-care is, what is involved in it, and the steps we need to take to begin implementing it. So Radical self-care, probably something we haven't really explored. We talk about regular self-care. It's a bit of a, a thing at the moment. It's out there in the wellness industry. All the gurus are kind of talking about the importance of it. But I take a bit of a different slant to it with my background in um, clinical practice and what I think from my own personal experience, radical self-care needs to look like. So let's get started. I thought I might just ask you to begin with rating yourself out of 10, you can pop this in the chat box if you'd like to, or you can kind of keep it to yourself. But in terms of the time and energy you're sort of spending on your well-being, where do you rate yourself out of 10 for intention around, you know, putting in place well-being practices on a daily basis? And in terms of, so we're seeing a six, an eight, a seven. Um, yeah, yeah. So intention's pretty high. And I think there's sort of a, a difference between the intention to bring into our world a well-being practice, something that we know is going to make us feel happier, healthier, better, and then the commitment to that. Where do you think you sit out of 10 for committing to your health or well-being goals? Good work, Louise. Okay, yeah, so that's where I get a bit wobbly. You know, I like this idea of being alcohol-free. I'm interested in the idea but I'm not committed to the idea. So there's a bit of a difference there. And then in terms of the effort that you think there is involved at your end currently in terms of hitting those wellbeing goals, making sure that you're implementing those healthy habits, where do you think you sit? Josie, nice nine. Heidi, yep, yeah, about average, about five. Eight, yep. Yeah. 
cool. Okay. So, we're, you know, no one's sitting at two or three. This is pretty good. And then in terms of the time you think it takes to be well, do you, where do you, in terms of the time you currently allocate to your well-being, your self-care practices, does it, out of 10, do you feel like it takes up a lot of your time or very little time? Yeah, it's easy. Not much time at all. Good. Okay, great. I want to ask something else now. So this is a little picture about of a car, right? It's, a, it's something I always remind people of when they're initially talking to me about a health problem or um, a health goal they're trying to achieve and how they can often find that um, it can be just too hard to go that step further to be able to really get a good result um, with what they're trying to achieve. And what I always say is, if we know that there's a sign our car is not working well, or we need new tires, or we know it needs a service, we know we need a new timing belt every now and again, things need to be changed and updated, we never hesitate to get that car to the mechanic and get the work done. But what we tend to see, generally speaking, is that people tend to not pay attention to their bodies when they're giving them signs that something needs to change or needs to be upgraded or actually needs to be, you know, maybe completely, you know, replaced. So I want you to kind of think of your body like a car and have a think about the different systems, the different elements of your well-being that might need an upgrade, that might need a bit more of a, um, a honing in on and some extra attention to detail. So I wanna just do a little bit of a body scan. This is what I do when I work with everybody that is a, a client of mine. Um, I go through their systems and I get a really broad and in-depth idea about where everything is sitting. Now, in my world, ideally everything is good. You know, you wanna be up at a nine or a 10 out of 10 for most of those things. And when something is out of balance because our well-being is about management, then we wanna address that. So just don't have to put this into the chat at all guys, but I wanna ask, like have a think to yourself, do I wake up and do I feel really good on a daily basis? Do I wake up, am I refreshed after a good night's sleep? Do I fall asleep pretty easily? Like, does it take me less than half an hour, 10 minutes, ideally? Do I wake up and know that I'm ready to go and I'm not having to hit snooze? Am I finding that my mood for the most part is quite balanced or do I struggle a little bit around, you know, anxiety, rumination, worry? Do I find that I can stay calm in stressful situations? Do I find that, you know, for the most part, when there's stress on my plate, um, oh no, Heidi, I just read that. <laughs> um, when there is stress, I um, do struggle or do I really, you know, cope and have the resilience to bounce back and have that stress tolerance that helps me keep things in check and not you know catastrophize or overshoot when it comes to stressful situations and I guess the other thing is looking at our digestion is it seamless are our hormones balanced are we just getting a cold a year and that's kind of it and our immune system is in check and is our weight sort of sitting at a healthy level is our blood pressure good so there are all these elements to our well-being when we sit down and kind of look at them system by system area by area hormones biochemistry we can often see that there are clues that we need to pay more attention to our physical, mental, emotional well-being, but also, you know, other elements of our well-being, like our environmental well-being and our spiritual and also our social well-being too. So quite often people have a number of these things out of balance if they have shelved themselves for too long. So Today is really about talking about why do we shelve ourselves? Why do we not really put our well-being first? 
And so I blame it on 21st century living. <laughs> um, I think with the industrialization that we saw in the 50s and 60s, the way that we do diet, our food, the way it's processed, obviously has changed, you know, to such a degree that we now see, you know, a good third of what's on our supermarket shelves is ultra processed food. It is not food that comes from nature. And the other thing that's happened is the way we do work. And so what work and life and how we treat our body, what we do with it has changed immensely. We work long hours. We're often very sedentary. And um, what that means is we're not really working with what our bodies were built for. We kind of work against the rhythms of our body. We don't move them enough. And so the, you know, the manifestation of that tends to be, for a lot of people, anxiety, insomnia, exhaustion. And then for the most part, and I think if you're, if you're wearing lots of hats in your life, we tend to be stressed, stretched and struggling. So it's really... Um, important that we sort of acknowledge that yes we live in a busy world Julia and I were just talking earlier about how we kind of had a year off last year and everyone talked about getting off the roller coaster ride that was their life they loved the pause some people I'm talking to now who are just like geez that worked for my family that worked for me slowing down stripping back editing a lot of editing went on about you know what was an what was a priority and so I think the silver lining around the pandemic and you know the numerous lockdowns we've had particularly in Melbourne has been this ability for us all to kind of reset and work out what to prioritize identify simplify and I really do think if, you know, your well-being, if your self-care is not up in that top three, um, in, in, if, you, if you can identify that, then we need to probably have a chat offline about me convincing you that it should be. So, you know, the thing that we tend to also see is that people don't really seek out support until there's a health scare or until there's a diagnosis, or until they're sick of feeling sick, you know? So that's when I get a phone call. I've always, sadly, been a last line practitioner. You know, people don't come for me for preventative wellbeing support. I wish they did because it would that would feel better and I would make my life easier when I work with them. But quite often what I see are middle-aged women, so it's those Gen X women, that for decades at a time have looked after other people, whether that's been their children or aging parents. And um, it doesn't necessarily have to be women. Often it's career progression and really focusing on moving up that ladder and putting work before ourselves that ends up causing us to have not just one or two things that are out of balance, but quite often it's a cluster of things that have gone wrong. So often it's, you know, the mood's not great, digestion's not good, hormones are out of balance and, you know, they are all interconnected. There's no doubt about it. When we start to explore the biochemistry and your hormones, we, we see that there are definitely correlations because nothing in the body happens in isolation. So, um, you know, that's when I get the call um, and that's when I have that conversation with a potential client about, yay, great that you've reached out for some help and there's a trajectory here that you can go on. You can start prioritising your well-being and do some things that we're going to consider to be a little bit radical, a little bit different to how you've looked after yourself up until now. And, um, or you can kind of not really take charge and make the changes that are necessary to get your life in balance and get you feeling good again. So this reminds me of um, a little story. My mom, my mom's like in her sixties and whenever I hang out with my mom and her friends and they, they just sit around talking about how sick they are and what medication they're on and it's just this kind of you know they've sort of resigned themselves to the fact that they're just going to be on meds forever and I sort of look at that and think no 
I don't want to do that. What I choose is to live in a way today that's going to help me have a beautiful retirement where I'm probably hanging around in Sardinia, Italy. That's what that photo is of. Living a long, disease-free life like those people in those blue zones do. So I can talk about blue zones a little bit later on if you'd like to know more. They're areas of the world. There's five of them that have been identified where people live and eat a certain way that adds on years so that they can live to 100 and they don't have chronic diseases. And it's very accessible. It's a very doable way of living. So, you know, you've got a choice. Like we can kind of not be working preventatively, not be super conscious of looking after ourselves, or we can really take on board the importance of looking after ourselves now for a better tomorrow. And I really like what James Clear, author of Atomic Habits, um, speaks about when he talks about this concept of implementing healthy habits in order to, you know, it's like compound interest so that you can kind of cash in down the track. So it makes complete sense. You know, it might not feel great today to get up and get to the gym at 6.15, four or five times a week, but down the track, of, you know, maybe a week or a month later, you start to feel better. But years down the track, you're really reaping the benefits of having done that. So I really want to spread the word about getting people to embrace radical self-care in order to get unstuck. If you know that you've got some health issues, if you know mentally, emotionally, you're not in your best place, if you know you can be feeling happier and healthier, really embracing radical self-care is important. Your mind, your body is going to love you for it. And I think radical self-care as opposed to regular self-care needs to be sort of explained and what I mean by reg radical is that it's not you know when I think of self-care people tend to conjure up these ideas in their head about going to a day spa or nail bar and you know having the odd massage or you know going on that retreat often when we're really at breaking point and what I really hope people do try and do more of is not work so hard not push themselves to the limit to get to a point where they have to have this kind of experience as a is a nice thing to do every now and again just as a bit of a stopgap. rather what I think we want to be trying to do is not is is looking after ourselves day in day out week in week out so that when we do get to the Christmas holidays, we're not crawling over the finish line. We're not having to take dramatic steps and have to get away um, just to kind of balance things. Um, so I'm a really big fan of really making sure that we implement lots of tiny sort of habits that kind of build on one another to have us feeling good day to day, week to week and onwards. Um, so, you know, the other thing about radical self-care is we are kind of pushing against a world that we live in that leaves us feeling rushed, that inhabits so much of this processed food that gets made in the factory and all that work. And we want to kind of push back and rethink what productivity looks like to us, rethink what our day-to-day -day living looks like and what we put in our mouth. So... Um, you know, it can seem radical to say to a client, I need you eating seven serves of vegetables a day. It can seem radical to say to someone, I need you to do at least half an hour of exercise pretty much every day of the week. But if we go back, that was kind of how we lived. And these days, because of the change in agriculture, we actually have to work a little bit harder to get our nutrition needs met. We have soil that's very depleted. We don't get the minerals from that soil that we used to get. In fact, if I need a client to up their selenium levels, as an example, it's an antioxidant we use to help support thyroid function, I'll get them to source Brazilian Brazil nuts, not Brazil nuts that were made here because our soil is so selenium depleted. And if I want someone to really up their fiber intake 
the way we used to grow vegetables, the fiber content was exponentially higher than what it is today. Um, in fact, you know, if you want to look at specific foods, an apple these days is so full of sugar the way that it's grown that I pretty much tried to get my kids to only ever eat a green apple if they're going to have an apple at all. So there's kind of this deficit that we need to make up and be a little bit more proactive about. So yeah, just generally getting people to do you know self-care as in eating well you know there's a bit of a nuance and there's there's a bit of stuff you need to know around that to really nail it so you know the other part of this radical self-care that's radical is the, the part where we actually put our oxygen mask on and put ourselves first so like I said earlier you know there can be a lot of putting other people's needs or putting our careers or other things in our life as a priority and not really tuning into and looking after ourself. And I think when we stop putting ourselves at the back of the line and start really coming to the front of the line and being able to tune into our body, being able to actually go through a process of self-discovery because I know it took me until I was in my 40s to actually kind of stop and go, what do I love? What do I need? What do I want? Because I hadn't really created the time and space to do that. So it can be really easy to kind of get, you know, ramble through life and just kind of be in autopilot. So I think me first comes, you know, as a starting point for radical self-care and then moving on from there, we start to really be able to um, live intentionally and with purpose. So for me, I feel like radical self-care, you know, I do a lot of work in the physical well-being space and I do a lot of work around mental health. So I can see through, you know, the decade plus of work I've done that there were gaps in what I was able to offer a client and I'm always working with people in a shared care capacity. So often we have a team that are helping you be your best version of you. And I think radical self-care encompasses our social well-being, how connected we are to others, ourselves, the world. Our environmental well-being is really important. There is this concept of building biology and sick building syndrome. We need to know that where we work and where we live are healthy places to be. Our spiritual well-being, which is also such a big part of how we feel and think, and that doesn't have to necessarily be religion. That can be lots of different things for different people that help us feel connected. Um, so, you know, when we start to embrace radical self-care, what we see is we are more connected. We feel connected to ourselves, to others and the world. We're happier because we find peace. And I think that was really big for me to just find peace within me and balance and maintain a positive mindset. And then we are healthier, we're energized, we can get up and do the stuff we want to do. We live a long disease free life. And I know I'm sort of at that midway through my life point, and I'm kind of heading, you know, looking ahead, going, what's that going to look like for me? Do I want to have an amazing time or do I want to be sick? So I think, you know, we can all make time for radical self care. It doesn't have to be labor intensive and it's different for everybody we all need a customized approach we all need um, something different you know what's good for me is probably not going to be suitable for the next person so that you need to explore that and it doesn't have to be intense if you're conjuring up ideas of having to get up at 5 a.m and do your journaling and your meditation and your yoga and then go do your gym class it doesn't have to be that because you're the person that kind of decides what that is, as long as it's having a positive and additive effect to your life. And so that's the part of my job that I love is helping people work out through using data points, through testing, investigations, genetic reports, working out how can I help you live best 
for you, your makeup, the person that you are, your genetic predispositions, the lifestyle that you have. Um, they're all the things that really help us inform what you should be doing rather than what you think you should be doing because there's a lot of noise out there about what that looks like. And, you know, finally, I just wanted to say, I really believe that radical self-care when we do it, we are caring for ourselves deeply and deliberately. And then there's a beautiful knock-on effect. We naturally care for our family, our friends, our colleagues, the world, and they get this amazing version of us. And so it's kind of this win-win situation. It has this beautiful positive ripple effect on the people around us. So that's what I had to say today about radical self-care. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks so much, Susan. I was um, listening as you go. And as soon as you said, you know, intention, commitment, effort and time, the numbers get lower every every time I step down to the next one. And um, it, I mean, I'll give people time to ask questions because there's been some great comments in, in the chat already. But while people are doing that, it's sort of, I want to prioritise myself. And I have the best intentions of prioritising myself. But the reality is that when I get home, you know, dinner needs to be made, the laundry needs to be done. And I'm not saying I do it all. My husband's incredibly um, helpful and uh, looked after himself successfully for 36 years before he met me. So I'm, 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 I'm Sarah's laughing because she, he, she knows him well. But um, so I, I am, even I've got that incredible support, I still find that, finding time for me or prioritizing for me is incredibly difficult so yeah I get it I okay. now like I've got two kids and I've been the person that is you know running her own practice which is a full-time practice nine and a ten a nine and an eleven year old and a husband who has a pretty demanding role which has meant there have been years at a time where he's worked extremely long hours so I'm the one that's often held the fort um I've learned to really reframe I know there were years there where I just felt so resentful about having to carry the load um I delegate more now that my kids are a little bit older I can all you know if, if for some people it's like if you don't like doing it, just get someone else in to do it. We kind of live in this world where we can create, you know, we can we, we can draw on services. And if you can afford to do that, that's a great thing. But I reframe. Like I get my headphones on when I have to do housework and I am blasting out Beyonce and, you know, like making it fun and just smashing it out in two hours and then getting on with my day. So for me, it doesn't feel like a chore. It's actually something I enjoy that helps me switch off from the constant thinking that comes with the work I do. <laughs> yeah, if you're good yeah, to hear. So you're nice. adding self-care into, into yeah, what music. What is already music there. is amazing as an energy state mm -hmm. changer. You know, it's so good. Yeah. And I know we talked about um, what last year felt like. There was a couple of comments in the chat about for people that um, felt that it had last year had the opposite effect on them. Yeah, in, so, like um, in terms of not being able to prioritize and kind of see the weeds from the trees. Is that what you mean? Oh, no, so I think where where um, where you and I were talking before, where you know we were sort of forced into how into homes and um, you know some of our work maybe disappeared or there were things like I I there's things last year that I consciously stopped doing because COVID gave me a very good reason not to keep doing them. Mm. And so I've actually got a choice, but for some people like they had, it had the opposite effect. So they were forced into the home, but they had more work to do than ever, or it was more mm. stressful than ever. Or from a, a mental health or wellbeing point of view, they felt that they were under more, yeah. they, that there wasn't yeah. less, it was more. So if you're in that sort of situation. Yeah. Yeah. Advice. Well, home, homeschooling children. I mean, I think for me, the, the first obstacle was moving past the resistance I felt about the drop in productivity and the overwhelm. And as soon as I shifted, I did a lot, this sounds really kind of woo woo and a bit maybe wanky, but I did do a lot of meditation around that because it was frustrating me on a daily basis in those early days. And the, the thing I landed on was 
you know, shifting from resistance about what was and moving into acceptance. And that made a huge difference again to my mindset. So instead of having a things to do list with seven things on it, it just dropped down to three and I gave myself a pat on the back if I got it done. Um, and it was just that, you know, I can only do what I can do. And I understand there's been a huge fallout, particularly, you know, in the States and even here in Australia around women's um, work as well. And where women have had to scale back, go part time or, or not work at all in order to manage that period of time when children were remote learning. And that really saddens me. Um, so there was definitely a fallout and there's no doubt I've seen clients who are still dealing with some mental health fallout post pandemic, you know, past post lockdown coming into this year. So we are definitely working on that. Yeah. It's um, also some conversations in the chat around, um, the opposite. So where you don't have the commitments of family or, you know, spouses or partners to get home to that you're the default person that's because you're single you can automatically work late or that you you you're there to carry the load for people that have you know commitments to get back to and I certainly know before um Justin and Riley were in my life that I was fell into that category too that uh, because I didn't need to do the school pickup or you know get to um the school festival or you know parent teacher day or whatever whatever reason people had to leave because mm. I was the one that would you know could do the late meeting or you know do the report late or um you know do a late call or, or whatever whatever insert whatever reason there was to stay at work yeah when actually what you're saying is the reason to leave is is kind of staring us in the middle every day in the mirror every day yeah absolutely and I think it's about creating boundaries you know I'm such a, you know, such a fan of just trying to get that message across about the importance of rest and recovery. You can't be as good in your uptime if you're not creating any downtime. So yeah. I really do think, you know, that wearing busy as a badge of honour and, and, and saying yes to lots of stuff, you know, I just have seen time and time again what that looks like long term. And some people constitutionally are really built to be able to be the workhorse, a lot of doing, a lot of, you know, and not much being. You know, I think about are you being a human being or are you being a human doing? Mm -hmm. um, and this concept of do, 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 get the productivity, this preoccupation we've kind of got with it, thinking about the number of hours we're putting in. I just don't, I, I just think it's something that we need to start pushing back against and going it doesn't make me feel good you know it leads to burnout it leads to exhaustion it leads to me being irritable um, and so I can see how it can be really tempting to and I have got clients who are actually addicted to work and, it, and identify that they use work to keep them preoccupied it's a form of not numbing but not really kind of looking into what why like why are we so addicted to the productivity piece yeah I certainly um now that I'm not in corporate anymore I now realize that when I was in corporate um it was there was a lot of the reason I worked was for validation um mm. and it took me quite a long time to realize that that's what it was but if I work hard and do a good job I'll get the praise that I'm looking for, which will give me the purpose for being there. And it's just this weird cycle. Yeah, there's definitely that element of, you know, you're a good girl, get the pat on the head and feel like you're being a, a good person. But really when we kind of go beneath that and get a little bit clearer about what, why, you know, and quite often there can be so much tied in that about our childhoods and our, any trauma. There's a lot that's kind of, um driving why we behave and, and 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 work the way we do yeah so if you're sort of sitting here listening and, and i think everyone that's listening is going yeah i need to do more work on this you you don't come to a radical self-care session unless you're hoping to do something um to improve your self-care um what what tips would you you give people just just in terms of starting because you've done this for years right this yeah. is your bread and butter 
And it's been my own journey, you know. I think it took me. I had, I had after I had my second baby. Um, I had like eight years of a lot of depression, anxiety, and stress, and it was to do with wanting to, you know, overachieve in my own business and frustration around having to be a primary carer as well. And I felt like this awful parent um, for, for having aspirations and wanting to have my own career. Um, I think pace the race is a really good one. So now I don't, I kind of set myself 30 day goals, 90 day goals, but I also have a five year plan for the first time in my life. And it really helps direct, you know, what I say yes to and what I say no to now and how I don't I think so pacing the race is really about not trying to do too much too soon and put yourself into burnout um, the other thing I think from a, a foundations of health perspective if I can say anything to anybody it's like get your sleep really really like perfect like per be particular about sleep um, the more I look into the neuroscience of sleep, the more I know it facilitates emotional first aid while we dream. It helps us learn, process, do deep work. Um, it rests us, it restores us. It, it, you know, we're, our brain is getting detoxed while we sleep. There's a whole system that does that. Um, so I think if, if you struggle with sleep, get on top of it. Um, and I think sleep even trumps nutrition sometimes um and then I'd just be like just be really kind to yourself like we are often our own worst enemy like if you spoke to your friends or your kids or your you know partner the way you speak to yourself in your own head sometimes they would they would not speak to you again so it's just you know be really gentle and you know know that it's a long game yeah there's um JC was asking in the chat, you know, what are some of the first steps you would take to overcome burnout? So if you know that you're mm -hmm. at that extreme end already and it's not even about necessarily, yeah, you know, you're um, not starting from zero, you're starting from a minus number, let's say is the best Yeah, there, there, is a, there is a proper rebuild that needs to occur. So first and foremost, we get talking to your GP and we run a whole lot of tests and we look at what your stress function looks like, what your morning cortisol, other adrenal hormones look like. And we basically want to start putting in all the nutritional cofactors to rebuild the adrenal gland in order for you to start mounting a healthier stress response. Um, and then from there, we're also working on nourishing the nervous system, addressing any nutrient imbalances, because when we're stressed, we don't digest very well. So often we are very depleted nutritionally and then we're missing lots of cofactors for so many bodily processes. So in a nutshell, we need to go and get some data and then work out how do we kind of nourish and, and, and prop you back up again. But I also think you got to treat that period of time like a period of convalescence as well. Like, you know, you're someone that has not been well and really does need to really go slow and pace yourself. We're not going out and running marathons like we are doing very yin-based exercise, stuff that's very quiet because we don't want to be activating the adrenal system unnecessarily. I um, find it quite interesting and, and this is again one of my own reflections from A, talking to you Susan, but you know just looking at how how my health's evolved over the last few few years as well, because I, I certainly feel like I've gone from 35 to 40 in, in pretty quick succession, but also that my health is probably, I'm, I feel older than I actually am from a health point of view. Um, and yeah. I actually went and had all of my blood, sorry, one of my reflections was, is that we generally go to the GP when we're sick, not to actually do preventative work. And so yep. I actually had all of my blood work done last week, I think it was, just mm. to just to say, well, where is my blood? Where is where are my vitamins? Where are my hormones? Where should they be um, mm. at 40? Is there something going on that I don't? Yes. <laughs> am, I, um, am, I tired? am I feeling tired because I'm, I'm not sleeping very well? Or am I tired because, you know, 
my vitamins aren't where they need to be or my hormones aren't yeah. where they need to be. Yeah, yeah. There's two things on that. And Louise, I've got an answer for your 3 a.m. wake up. I just saw that in the chat. So number one, like I, I love working with doctors and I have a really great network. And I think, you know, integrative doctors, GPs, a whole other level, right? They they understand nutrition and medicine. Um, I, I've trained some of those doctors in mental health and gut health um, training modules um, through a, an association they're all a part of. And they know how to interpret those test results that I look at in the same way I do. There's a bit of an art to it, sort of my superpower. Your, your suburban general kind of doctor that you know, learnt on rounds in hospitals how to look for outliers on results is not going to look in and make the connections and have the depth of understanding that you would hope for. So sometimes you've got an iron deficiency problem and they're not going to really call it and, and, and act on it when actually what we're looking for when we're interpreting your results is optimal, not in the range. And so, you know, there, there's a whole lot of stuff in there that often will slide as being normal, but it's not. And then that thing around hitting 40 and kind of heading into that, well, you know, you've been around for four decades. So that ability to kind of mount the same kind, now what you did at 20 is very different to what you can do at 40. And we have to kind of come to grips with that, sadly. Um, but for women in particular, our hormones start to kind of do this weird fluctuation where our thyroid, which is, you know, there for metabolism and a whole bunch of other stuff, but our, our stress hormones, our blood sugar regulating hormones and our women's hormones are all so interconnected and it's a bit of a roller coaster ride for a lot of women. So we can end up you know, losing our waist, which happened to me during COVID. I was like, just all this extra, you know, spare tire stuff going around my midriff. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden you're not as resilient when you're stressed and you're like yelling at everyone and then you're starting to overheat. Like it's that classic perimenopause thing that starts to happen that no one really talks about. And I'm researching at the moment and want to speak to a hundred women in their forties about how they're feeling. Um, because there's so much you can do. So often it's blanket kind of, you know, umbrella term is your hormones are doing weird stuff. And then within that, there are sort of four different areas around hormones that you want to explore. And speaking of hormones, Louise, that 3 a.m. wake up is typically an adrenal um, stress response where uh, between 1 and 3 a.m., if we always wake up around that time, what we tend to find when we test, you know, morning cortisol is that um, we're seeing, you know, an imbalance there and we're probably overshooting in terms of how we respond to stress. So that doesn't have to necessarily be psychological stress. It can sometimes be physiological stress as well. You know, doing very strenuous exercise is very stressful in the body. So stuff like that. Yeah. We've probably got time for one or two more questions, but uh, Susan, I know when you did the session last uh, year at Vid19, you blew my mind with just your deep, deep expertise in, in everything to do with the body. And uh, yeah, I feel like I should come and talk to you some more. And yeah. uh, so we'll do that after Vid. vid Open door. Vid21 um, finishes. And uh, I, I actually, Justin and I were talking uh, well, we used to try and get away every three or four months, even if it was just for a night. And then we were talking last last week about how long it's been since we did that because it was you couldn't get away last year, so we haven't actually felt like we've had a break, even though you know we did obviously down tools. We haven't physically been away anywhere, mm -hmm. so uh, we were going away at Easter for four days. Um, yeah, good. And that was that was the prescription I gave out a couple of week, weeks ago. I had a week of just speaking to a lot of my Melbourne clients. And what I noticed was there was this trend that they were still in this lockdown mindset where we've opened up, but in their heads, they're like, I'm still stuck at home. And it was really getting them down. And the things they would have done like retreats or conferences stuff that would have been that breaking up of the, 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 the groundhog day nature of what our lives became, that was gone. And so I'm like, you need to book three days away. You need to go stay in a city hotel on your own. You need to, and it was really nice. And I actually had it up in my socials where I'm like, do you need to just get away from everyone? Because I think solitude is an amazing form of self-care. Like, you know, 
I didn't think I was next an introvert, but I think COVID taught me that I really like time on my own. Um, but I had my kids kind of in the house 24 7 for a year. Yeah. So you Jace, were never Jace on your saying, own. Yeah. Jace is saying everyone she speaks to feels like they're still recovering from last year, including herself. Um, Nosh says, yeah, people are still in lockdown mode in their heads. It's like, yeah, I went into town on Sunday to, to uh, buy a few things. I think it's the first time I, I almost had to remind myself that I, how easy it was to go into town because I haven't, I'm 4K is from the centre of Melbourne, but because I haven't been shopping for a year, it was just like, oh, yeah, I can just get the tram and like had to almost relearn how to shop. Kind of, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of relearning. <laughs> a lot of relearning. And um, Heidi says, if you need extra volunteers in your 40s, uh, I'm assuming you're putting up your hand, Heidi. Yeah, um, Heidi, I can I? Too. I'm just going to put my email. Like it's in my notes on my slide deck. But if anyone would love to talk to me, I just want like 20 minutes of your time, few questions. Um, I think it's something, you know, all the women I work with are just like, why isn't anyone talking about this? Um, but I think someone told me about a podcast called the Hot Flush podcast that's supposed to be hilarious. But it's, I think it's for women that are kind, they have pretty much sort of transitioned and uh, menopausal. But I think there's a perimenopause piece that no one's really exploring. Yeah. And there's so much you can do. And so much of it is connected to the stress and how we did the stress leading up to that period of time so um, when we stop making estrogen in our ovaries it's our adrenal glands that give us that bit of estrogen and if we kind of did stress to the max for decades at a time well you know they're kind of going to say sorry mm. not here to i help. think it, i think it's something that needs to be talked about more broadly i know um i was talking to my mum about the trials and tribulations of getting older and she said oh you're not perimenopausal, are you? And I was just like, I'm not sure. I'm 39. Why would I be that? And she goes, well, I went through the change early. I was like, why didn't you tell me that? Like, yeah, suddenly, as soon as you tell me that, yeah. <laughs> suddenly it all starts to make sense. But anyway, yeah. I digress. Um, please show some love for Susan in the chat. And it uh, sounds like you've got a few willing volunteers for your 100 women. Um, Susan, I will definitely put up my hand and reach out to you as well. Happy to have a conversation. Yeah. Louise says, excellent session, we'll look you up. Um, yeah, and she also says, one of the reasons why many women are not in senior roles and are on boards, I agree. Um, and uh, what was Nosh's suggestion? Hang on, Susan, can you do something with men too? I am the only male in the session. I wonder if men think they don't need to take care of themselves. Uh, I think so much of it applies to men as well. And um, you know, foundations of health and just making sure that you put you first and keeping those boundaries in place. Like, you know, you've got to look after yourself and no one else is going to do it. And that's the thing I realised was like, you know, I wanted my kids and my partner and everyone else to kind of take notice, but it's, it's up to me. And then you're so much happier when you're doing it for yourself anyway. Perfect.